Okay, hey everybody, welcome back. Um, I know it's weird uh, this week, even weirder than things already were. Um, but yeah, it's been hard. I'm sorry for delays on everything. Um, I'm, you know, aside from, you know, this, my sister-in-law is very much my sister. I've known her for 20 years and, and having lost her uh, has been just insane, but also having my wife even more so, you know, her sister had a pretty tough childhood in their entire life, you know, constant companions, very close in age. Uh, she, you know, she's devastated and is breaking down all of the time. And it's really hard for me in those moments to be able to like, oh, well, I got to go record a lecture right now, or I got to go grade papers right now. Um, and even thinking about that has been tough. Plus, I'm taking care of all the arrangements for staff. And she was a, you know, a messy person and messy people when they die. Apparently, like, that's a lot to clean up. Um, especially when there's a, a kind of mal, socially maladjusted pit bull in the mix. Um, it was very sweet, but yeah, I don't know. This makes things a little more complicated in all of this. So um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to uh, put this any of this onto you guys. That's not your problem. I'm just wanting to offer you some sort of explanation for why things are going uh, slower. You know, I, I, I thank you so much for the people who have sent emails. It's sympathetic. Um, you know, just all of you being understanding through this makes things a lot easier for me. Um, but uh, I was behind before this thing whole thing happened because I hadn't graded midterms. I still haven't graded those uh, uh, Eye of the Prize things yet. Um, I'm going to get it tomorrow. I got to drive up to Folsom to take this maladjusted pit bull um, somewhere. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try and at least get some of that stuff done in the, in the next few days and get us back on a regular lecture, le lecture schedule. Uh, this week's lecture is going to be relatively short. Um, and, uh, and then I have some, a big one planned to come out on Tuesday. Uh, probably a really long one since we've had some really short ones. Um, but obviously you guys are going to be getting um, you know, a lot less in this class than you normally would have. Um, but I think um, that's kind of to be expected um, without deaths in the family and things like that. So um, anyhow, uh, as you can tell, we're covering uh, Chinese immigration today. Um, last time I talked about European immigration and sort of this, the building uh, resistance towards them. Uh, Chinese immigrants are going to face uh, much more of that. Um, and then next week, we're going to kind of see xenophobia reach a peak um, until borders get shut down completely in the United States. If you didn't know that was a thing, yes, that is a thing. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about eugenics probably. I hope to get that in there on Tuesday too. Uh, I think we're gonna have a monster lecture on Tuesday. Um, but I don't know, every time I promise something in this class, something comes up where I can't do that. So anyhow, um, let's, without further ado, um, so there was, there was not any Chinese immigration really uh, in the United States until there was a United States on the Pacific coast. It makes a lot more sense, it's a lot easier. There was you know, very, very few Chinese people in uh, the United States up until you know, we settled into California. It makes sense, it's a lot closer to be able to get to than the Atlantic coast. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second, but it's worth mentioning there is, there was a particular um, some stuff going on in China, which encouraged uh, immigration out of there. Last week, I talked a lot about what was going on in home countries that encouraged people to leave. It was not just the promise of uh, America is just awesome, you know, that, that a lot of people were being chased out of their countries. Um, and there was a similar experience going on in, uh, in China as well. It's after it's almost eight o'clock tonight, so yeah, I have my drink. Um, yeah, I don't know. One of my friends joked that it asked me if I was drinking while recording the Zoom lectures, and joked that you guys are going to call me Professor Bourbon by the end of this. Um, don't do that, please. At least not in the earshot of any other faculty or anything. Um, I don't know. I think I'm in my house. I can have a drink while I record lectures. Uh, anyhow. Speaking of mind-altering substances, um, what was going on in China has to do with uh, uh, opium. 
so what this basically accounts uh, it boils down to British Empire had been expanding out, becoming you know the dominant empire on the globe, and uh, you might know that you know they had held India for a really long time, and as they are conquering India uh, and mo moving up, um, you know, it, it into the inlands of India, and it, at the time India wasn't just India; it was you know uh, Pakistan, uh, it could even be considered part of Afghanistan, Bangladesh. All of that stuff was kind of all one big you know the Indian subcontinent. And as they're going up in like Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh area, they find massive amounts of opium that, 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 that have been growing up there. I guess a lot, I think a lot of it w w was wild. I don't even think it was particularly cultivated. Um, and, um, but the, 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 like, we have, this is a shit ton of opium that we could use somehow. Um, but we can't, we don't want to sell this back home. You know, you know, they know what opium does. If you don't know, I mean, surely you know in this country now what an opiate is. You know, it's a super addictive drug. Um, you know, it is what makes heroin heroin. So, you know, it's incredibly addictive and turns people into junkies. You know, we have an opiate, opioid crisis uh, in this country right now. And the, the British authorities realize, like, well, we can't sell this on the streets of London. And we, we don't even want to sell it in Europe at all. We don't want to sell it. We, we can't have junkies in Paris and you know that it's a you know epidemic that will spread so who could we sell all this opium to that we just do not care about at all well we don't want to we're conquering India so we don't want to get you know want to be the Indians uh well there's a ton of Chinese people and we don't care about them um you know China was had been relatively untouched by any colonialism in the early 19th century and um uh, the British will say, okay, well, we're going to sell opium here. And China was at a particularly destabilized moment. China has often been the dominant force in Asia. Um, but in the early 19th century, there had been uh, a whole bunch of problems. I, Asian history is not my thing, so I don't claim to understand what it is. But no, you know, uh, they were not a unified, powerful country at that moment. But what authorities there were in China uh, were uh, saying, well, we don't want you to sell opium here either. You'll make a bunch of junkies here. So uh, the British said, well, we're going to do it anyway because we're British uh, and, and we have guns. Um, so they fought a war over this right to sell opium. And the, the British will eventually win, uh, more or less. They're not looking to conquer China. They don't want to hold China, especially they don't want to hold the, uh, the country that the people they are making into junkies. They just want to hold just enough of it to make a... Uh, a port to bring opium in and be able to be able to freely sell their drugs uh, on the open market in China. That's why they take the small island of Hong Kong. This is how Hong Kong becomes separate than the rest of China. It's because it's a British protectorate for uh, like 150 years, um, up until 1997, the, the British finally give it back to China. And now there's a sort of weird stage of where um, they are, you know, where, where Hong Kong is right now is because it was, you know, the, the importation um, spot for uh, the British. So uh, already relatively war-torn and ununited and kind of chaotic uh, China now has, is fighting this war against the British and having drugs run rampant through there. Uh, it is a good time to want to get out of China, more or less. So this more or less coincides with uh, the discovery of gold. Uh, in, in uh, California. And they're going to, uh, just like people from all around the world are going to be coming to California, uh, literally from, you know, from every corner and every country with the promise of you know, easy riches. If you can make it to California, people have this belief that they like every person who makes it here uh, strikes it rich. And uh, they all plan to come, you know, kind of temporarily then be able to go home, uh, incredibly wealthy men. Um, and it's mostly men who are, who are coming by far. Only 3% of the people coming into California at this time are women. Um, but that's sort of something separate right now. Uh, so Ch Chinese immigrants are going to come to California. And it's, like I said, it's literally people from all over the world. It is even, it becomes the most cosmopolitan place on the planet. Cosmopolitan by, I what to mean, like different kinds of cultures and people living in the same place. That's what that word means. Um, and, you know, no place in the world ha has more diversity uh, than California. But even in this land of immigrants, the Chinese are going to stand out more than anybody else. Most of the people coming are American. 
most of them are, are northern or northern white Americans, but there's plenty of European, um, Irish, Australians. Uh, a lot of those people are white people, um, but a lot of people also come from Latin America as well. Um, and you know, it debates on wh whether to classify them as white or not. Um, it's even to this day I never understand why um, there's like white and, and Latin American non-white is a different census thing. I don't know. It's, it, that's that's really me going off topic. But anyhow, uh, you know, at least like, you know, most of the people that come in have this shared history, shared religion, uh, which is a very big deal at the time, um, being, of everybody being uh, Christian, you know, the, the mix of Catholic and Protestant, uh, for sure, but at least having some of this shared history together, whereas the Chinese are going to show up here, and they're just going to stick out like sore thumbs, because uh, you know, the religion, their culture, uh, their clothes, their haircuts, uh, of course, you know, uh, physical appearance, uh, their food, uh, everything is going to be different. Um, and most people here it really had not had a lot of interaction with them before. So, you know, in an incredibly racist time, and, you know, with incredibly racist cultures, you know, and California, did not blend easily with getting along with all of these different kinds of people. Um, the Chinese are really going to get the worst of it because everybody sort of agrees that, like, who are these people? Well, I don't know. I don't like them. Whoever they are is basically their idea. Um, so that's going to make, you know, they're going to be shut out of a lot of things. Uh, and that is going to make assimilation that much harder for them. And the kind of constant uh, thing you hear, like I had said last week, um, they was like, oh, these people are too weird. They could, they'll never be able to assimilate. Oh, the Italians, they can't assimilate to this culture. You know, it's, it's whatever it is, it's saying that they can't assimilate. Well, like Chinese, because they're treated so badly and because they already have these cultural differences, are going to be very slow to assimilate. They will be, there'll be Chinese people living in the United States for decades without really getting outside of Chinatowns, so without becoming part of the larger American culture. It's not until World War II that we start to see uh, Chinese people getting out of Chinatowns and participating in America's, American civic life. Um, and you start seeing Americans go into Chinatown. You start to see, you, you think of San Francisco Chinatown today um, as you know, sort of a tourist place where people go into, but that was definitely not the case. Um, but again, I might be getting ahead of myself right here. So that sort of uh, obvious uh, difference, it, they're going to be treated worse. Um, but like I said, most of them uh, coming here are um, part of the gold rush. Let me, I think I should shrink this little window a little bit. I don't know how much you guys see of that window. Um, oops. So most of them coming here are uh, at first coming uh, to be miners, like all of the other uh, people coming from around. They're called Argonauts, generally. Uh, and that, sometimes we call them 49ers today because a lot of them came in 49. That's where the football team name come, football team name, football team's name comes from. Uh, people that came in 49 became known as 49ers. But that wasn't until years later. Generally, at the time, everybody called them Argonauts. Um, which is a, a Greek reference, like uh, Jason and the Argonauts, these guys that sailed the sea, they braved all the stuff and adventures. That's what that's a reference to. Uh, they're looking for the Golden Fleece. We, so we have all these people traveling by sea to California uh, in search of gold. They got called Argonauts. So uh, all the Argonauts, like I said, mainly men because uh, it's expensive to kind of get here. Uh, most don't plan on staying. They want to go home uh, shortly after they strike it rich. Um, and they know it's a dangerous place. So it's a thing that, you know, at the time without, you know, we, this is a journey you don't bring women along. So just like all, all of the other people coming, um, it was mostly uh, Chinese men by, by far. Um, and at first, in small numbers, a lot of, uh, a lot of the Americans sort of praised the Chinese and early, 1849, you see a lot of like, oh, these Chinese people like are very industrious, you know, like, like miners want to work with them and everything. But um, that starts to fade away as more and more people show up. Um, the more you have of any group showing up, the more they end up getting demonized. Um, they call the, the Chinese name for California and really the United States in general, be, be, you know, Gamsan is the Gold Mountain. 
um, from it near, you know, just like everybody else, this promise of being able to strike it rich. Of course, striking it rich is always more difficult than, it, you know, than it's supposed to be, and most people don't find gold. And especially for the Chinese, um, they're going to be kicked out of the mining camps uh, really quickly. Um, they'd be char they're charged extra taxes, or they're just physically thrown out, or people are, are murdered until they, you know, they understand they have to leave. But they don't want to go home, and they still have more opportunities to make more money here, so they have to find other ways to be able to work. Um, for a lot of them, that's going to be working on the railroad. They're going to build um, the, the Transcontinental Railroad. After the Civil War, uh, the country re really united around this national project of having a railroad line that runs from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, and when it's completed, it's amazing. It, like, you know, it used to take, you know, to get from New York to San Francisco used to take months and months of, uh, you know, traveling through the wilderness uh, by wagon train and you're going to get dysentery, like the Oregon Trail, and you're going to end up eating some of, your, some of your relatives, like the Donner Party or something like that, you know, but once it's completed, there is, uh, you know, you can, you can get from New York to San Francisco in, in three and a half days, um, but somebody has to build that train and uh or build out those tracks and uh it's a difficult job that pays very low money they're going to pay as, as low as possible to be able to build this thing and uh, you know it's a job americans don't want to do as always the immigrants take the jobs americans don't want and then the americans get mad that the immigrants are taking their jobs uh but that's the story as old as america and it's really as old as everywhere anyway. It's not just Americans that are racist that way, that's pretty much humanity. Uh, so anyhow, uh, the Chinese are, are largely gonna build the western half of this railroad. It's gonna end up meeting up in Utah. Uh, and to do that, they have to build the railroad through the Sierra Nevadas, uh, which is if you've gone through, um, you know, you're driving I-80, I you know, you know, from Santa Rosa, you know, and you, like you, you go through Sacramento, uh, and, and uh, you're, you're heading towards Reno, and you go through over the Sierra, Sierra Nevadas. You'll see in the mountains, you'll see like these tunnels. You see huge, long trains. These trains, these giant freight trains, going on there, uh, kind of going next to the freeway, or you know, sometimes about a mile away across, you know, on some mountains. But you can see like you know, going through these tunnels. Well, somebody had to build those tunnels, uh, and back then, they meant dynamiting. And who's going to do that? The Chinese people are going to do that. Um, but we're working with dynamite, um, you know, of course, is incredibly dangerous. There's lots of cave-ins, avalanches, uh, things like that. We don't really know how many hundreds of, you know, maybe thousands of, of Chinese people died in there because they were just considered to be cheap, disposable labor. Um, you know, their lives are just very undervalued. Um, and, of course, you know, it's miserable. It's hella hot in the summer in the mountains, it's hella cold in the winter in the mountains, um, and you know, they, they have to build this through there. But once it's done, it's seen as this great American accomplishment. Way to go, American power, Woo, we rule, we built the Transcontinental Railroad. But yeah, really, uh, a large part of that was built by Chinese laborers who were being treated horribly uh, then and afterward. So, um, now you're actually going there? Okay. Um, one of the other uh, avenues for working, if you, uh, you know, can't work in the mines, uh, if you don't, the dangerous work of the, uh, the railroad is too much, laundries became a thing. In a society in California where there's so few women, um, and really for decades, it, it, it is skewed, for, for, you know, like, even in the year 1900, um, there's like, uh, I think it's about 30% um, female population is 70% male population in, in California. It is very skewed for a very long time. Uh, it's not until the 1950s that, that we actually get to a 50-50 ratio. Uh, but anyway, uh, jobs that women traditionally did were incredibly valued. Most of these men coming here never learned how to sew or cook or do laundry. There were women around them. Even unmarried men had sisters and mothers and you know women in their towns and things like that to do that. Then they show up in mining camps and you know in heavily male San Francisco, and there is no um, you know, no one to do laundry. The Chinese inter enterprising Chinese people said, "We can fill this. We can the, the you know the, the market has you know has, has a." a you know, has a gap in it, we can fill. So um, 
they, as you know, so Chinese laundries become a thing. And this is still like a thing to this day. You know, the Chinese laundries are, you know, in, in big cities, wherever you go, that, you know, there's many, many uh, laundry places that are owned by Chinese people. If you're going to take your laundry to get done rather than going to a laundromat, it's likely to be Chinese people that owned it. And it has a traditional thing. And it's not because there's like some sort of ancient Chinese secret to do laundry or something. It's because there was, you know, this is a business that had, you know, had been passed down really since the gold rush. Um, and sort of the irony of it was uh, men didn't, American men didn't want to do this work because they considered it to be women's work. Um, and they would make fun of the Chinese guys for doing this women's work and call them, uh, you know, a feat. But, um, it was, but the Chinese people also thought it was like women's work and they, and they, they felt it was undignified for them to do as well. Um, but it's good money and it beats working and, uh, you know, dynamiting a tunnel through the Sierra Nevadas. So, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's, you know, it's pretty smart maneuvering. So, um, since there was so much assault on Chinese people all the time, they get kicked out of mining camps. Uh, there's Chinatowns really like, in every big city on the West Coast. Um, there are Chinatowns. Uh, a lot of them will end up being burned down over the years because you, you know it's well racism, but like uh, you know so there a lot of them were going to end up retreating to San Francisco, which was always sort of the home base. You know, that was the place where everybody, um, you know, came through. We, the most Chinese people getting off the boat were getting off the boat in San Francisco. So uh, San Francisco has always had the, the, uh, the oldest and largest uh, Chinatown. And Chinatown, you know, is not, it's safety in numbers, for sure. The more people that you have makes it hard, that much harder to be attacked. Um, you can't have a bunch of drunken dudes coming in there and starting you know, and beating people up um, when there's hundreds and thousands of Chinese people uh, living in, in, in one area. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're living off on your own and you, you know, you're just a few families, you make a much easier target. So it offers protection, but it also offers a piece of home. Um, it, it, somewhere where everything is familiar, everybody's speaking, you know, there's many Chinese dialects, but everybody's speaking at least similar languages. Um, you know, there, there was, um, you know, the opera houses, uh, Chinese restaurants, uh, shops, you know, Chinese medicine, Western medicine are very different things. And to this day, Chinese friends I have, some of them do not trust Western medicine. They're like, no, 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 this is a real problem. I have to go with, you know, find out how much fire and wind is balanced in me. And I don't, sorry, that sounds like I'm being condescending. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's just a different style of medicine uh, in that sense. So you have, you know, the, like the very tight knit community. It feels like home. It was sort of like, like, I don't think this happens anymore, but it may be used to where you would have a, a, a Chinese uh, person, you know, some, someone who'd be born in Chinatown, you know, in America, they're an American citizen and never learn how to speak English because they were, um, you know, they, they, they spent the, the whole lives in Chinatown uh, and never went out of there. I don't know how much that actually happens. It's, I think it's kind of a legend. Um, I'm sure some people right now are like, no, no, I never. I have a friend who's a friend whose grandmother is like that. But it's always a friend who's a friend's grandmother. It, it, uh, it never actually seemed to, you know, those people never seem to materialize. Um, anyhow, again, I'm full of digressions today. I'm having not the best, easiest time concentrating. Uh, so uh, this, you know, makes Chinatown feel safe and home. You know, you look at the architecture, you can see why there would be, um, even today you walk down Grant Avenue in San Francisco and, you know, has that Chinese architecture, which makes it so interesting to go to and kind of makes it the tourist place that it is today. But that was very comforting to people back then. But this also, since they are living in this area and not having to go out of there ever, that's going to make assimilation hard. It's going to make the, becoming part of the larger American society difficult. Um, Amer Americans will never accept them. Um, why they're in behind? The, the, there's no actual wall, but there's this sort of some symbolic or metaphysical or you know cultural wall around Chinatown. Um, and these people will never, you know, if they're not ever interacting with each other, they're never going to learn how to live with each other. 
So uh, the anti-Chinese discrimination and racism will last much longer than it would be, say, like the Irish or the Italians and things like that, who just integrate into American culture naturally. Um, so like I said, it's around World War II that you really start to see a change uh, happening. And like most Americans would never have eaten Chinese food until, you know, the 1950s. Um, and now, dude, I love, it's the best. I love Chinese food. Um, but, you know, it's a staple of American food. Yeah, but, you know, that would not have been a thing uh, until back then. So, um, changing gears. Uh, the people who had it by far the worst uh, in this time were Chinese women. Like I said, there were not very many Chinese women. Very, very, very tiny percentage of them. Um, and unfortunately, the ones that were here um, sometimes were not here voluntarily, and they were forced into uh, a life of sexual slavery. Um, they were considered to be prostitutes uh, at the time. They were categorized as prostitutes. You can see in 1870, the census in San Francisco records 61% of all Chinese females in, in the city as being prostitutes. Um, and this was, there was a big scam running around um, China at this time of having uh, men would show up in some rural village uh, that's having all of the problems that China had had at this time, and you know, feeding your family is relatively difficult. Um, and uh, say, hey, I have a, um, you know, I, I'm going to America. I'm going to Gold Mountain. I'm going to strike it rich as a gold miner. Uh, I need a wife. Can I, uh, you know, can I get yours? Uh, not your your wife, your your daughter. You know, which is your daughter. Um, they negotiate something. You know, dowries, all that kind of stuff. I'm, I don't know enough about Chinese marriage marriage practices to, to know how that gets negotiated but uh so the woman leaves the village thinking she's going to be the wife of this dude uh and then they go get on a boat to california and f she finds she's just one of dozens you know if not more women on this boat um who are not going to be wives they are going to be sex slaves um, and the, you know, they may be chained up. In a lot of cases, they're forced to smoke opium and become opium addicts on the way there because once they get here, uh, that puts a further leash on them. Uh, opium is so addictive that you could literally die if you get addicted to it, that you can, you can die having withdrawals, just not having, you can't go cold turkey from opium. It can kill you. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a further leash on them. For the most part, like the, like the unfortunate woman you see in this picture, those women are gonna never leave the brothels. They're gonna get here, take into the brothels and be locked up in there. Um, they're gonna live in small cells um, that, you know, that will be their room. Um, and, you know, but if by some chance they do escape, then, you know, they have to come back because of opium. It's not like they have a lot of places to go because Chinese people are so discriminated against. Plus, the, Chinese women have this reputation of being opium addicts and prostitutes. Um, so nobody is particularly sympathetic to them. Um, so their lives were just miserable. Like, I just, it's just heartbreaking to contemplate. Um, we don't really have a lot of, as far as I know, any first person accounts um, of this, but we know these women lived in tiny little areas and men you know, came in to do what they do and leave. Um, if men got violent, uh, against them, then um, their lives were again were considered to be very cheap, um, and you know it was not big a deal. The suicide rate amongst these women was apparently just phenomenal. Of you know women looking for uh, uh, any way to be able to kill themselves, jumping into the bay, things like that. Um, like I said, it's it's it's, it's heartbreaking to to even consider a, a life like that. Um, but the larger American culture gets this idea in their head that oh, all Chinese women are, are uh, the prostitutes and, and they're opium addicts. Um, and this is just, you know, I, I don't know how much people actually believe that or if it's a talking point at the time. Uh, you see it mentioned a lot, but people talk about a lot of dumb stuff today that I know that they don't believe. So um, it's hard to say, you know, back then, but it was used as this thing of like, oh, look at the inferiority, inferiority of Chinese culture. If they, you know, of, Every woman in China is, was ba is basically a drug addict and a prostitute. They, if you just pay her, she'll do anything. You know, and then that's how that's how debased their, their culture is. Um, so it was used as as a uh, a cudgel, uh, you know, against them. And 
um, there would be a number of laws passed restricting uh, immigration of Chinese women to the point where even by 1890, um, only 5% of all the Chinese people in the United States, only 5% of them were women. Um, I don't know at what point that started to even out, but um, you know, it gives you a sense of, of how skewed uh, you know, that is. And it's actually uh, the first uh, federal law that restricts any kind of immigration whatsoever in this country um, is against is aimed at Chinese women. The first time that we start to close our borders uh, at all is this Page Act of 1875, and in the law, it's written in, in a sense of having, um, you know, something you can sort of get behind this idea of well. We're trying to end sexual slavery. We see how bad these women have it. So it's illegal to bring women here without free and voluntary consent for their purpose of holding them uh, to a term of service. Basically, you can't bring in women here to be slaves. Um, so it, you know, it punished people that would bring them into here. But it was used in a way to just make sure that all women, all Chinese women were not able to enter the country because it classified all Chinese women as being potential prostitutes. So, and they, they even at the time, um, the guy who the bill is named after, a guy named, uh, a representative named uh, Horace F. Page, um, introduced this bill and even saying, he even said, uh, it ends the danger of cheap uh, Chinese labor and immoral Chinese women. So we already talked about the immoral Chinese women, I'm gonna get into it in a second about the idea of cheap Chinese labor. Um, is there anything else I needed to say in this actually before I move on? Uh, eventually that ban's gonna basically, it's gonna basically be used, you know, all East Asian women will not be able to enter, enter the country. Um, but there really was not a lot of immigration coming in besides, besides China. Um, okay, I don't need to say anything else there, I don't think. So, um, you know, he brings the idea of cheap Chinese labor as a threat in that. In this law, that has to do with, you know, we think about ending forced prostitution. Um, why is labor a part of that? Because there was this uh, sense that, again, will ring uh, familiar today of uh, Chinese, there, there will soon be hordes of Chinese people. There will, there will, we're going to have all of these immigrants coming in the country. They're going to take our jobs and they're going to overrun uh, our culture. They're not going to assimilate. They, they don't want to be Americans. And eventually they will, um, you know, we won't recognize American culture anymore because uh, it'll be what they called it mongrelized uh, at the time. Um, the yellow peril was also the term that was used. This idea uh, you could see in this picture um, of you know uh, I, it's supposed to be California. You see Eureka on, on, on the thing there. That's you know the California logo. You know California welcoming the, welcoming the Chinese people in. Then they get all the money and you know and, and she can't and they're too powerful they can't leave. Nothing like this ever materialized. This is like the caravans of, of people that you know, supposed to show up and, just, and run across our border at any minute and, you know, and, and kill all of our daughters, but never actually seems to happen. Um, but that was the, uh, you know, the prevailing sort of sense at the time. So, um, and again, like I said, it, 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 it also often get, gets couched in, you know, these people are stealing our jobs. By and large, again, they're doing jobs, uh, immigrants doing jobs Americans don't want to do but they still get mad that they're stealing our jobs. And we can actually, uh, it, San Francisco and California will always be sort of the epicenter of that because it's gonna have the largest Chinese population. But we can actually track the moment that um, this labor fear uh, spreads to the East Coast and the rest of the country. Because um, we know it has to do with this uh, North Adams uh, shoemaker factory. Uh, which is, North Adams is just outside of Boston. I think it might be in Boston now. Um, in 1870, there's a shoemaker factory that's mainly Irish workers working there and have their own union. Uh, and they're working there and they feel like they're not getting paid enough, so they go on strike. They'd like to have more money. Um, so we're not working until you pay us more. And uh, the factory owner would, doesn't want to give in. And he had a friend in San Francisco that had told him, hey, 
I can send over some Chinese laborers to you. Laborers to you. The guys are the best. They work really hard. They don't. Um, uh, they, they they never go on strike. Uh, you don't have to pay them very much. So Chinese laborers show up at the factory. The first thing they do is build uh, barracks. Um, at, you know, the, 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 you know, dormitories and things like that. They build walls around there because you know the uh, factory owner anticipates the you know, potential violence in this um, labor. Uh, strikes were, were no joke at this time. Violence was assured, basically. Um, so, you know, they, they build up the protection there. And also, it's, you know, the, now these Chinese workers are never going to leave, um, you know, this factory. Um, and uh, sure enough, the, um, the the workers are great. Uh, they're they're making they're, they're working for cheaper they're making better shoes they're doing it faster than uh the irish workers everywhere everywhere um and the irish workers will ask them like will you join our union and like the chinese workers are like you don't have our interests in mind you're just looking out for yourself um you, 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 now we both won't have jobs if, you know if we go with by you and all, all the local factory owners and newspapers praise like oh this factory owner is so smart he, he brought in these chinese workers uh he's saving way more money um isn't isn't this guy the best um there's even a um an article written in the local Boston newspaper that said, uh, the Chinese labor regularly and consistently, losing no blue Mondays on account of Sunday's dispensations, nor wasting hours on idle holidays. Um, which is a uh, 1870 way of saying Irish people get drunk on the weekend and come to uh, work hungover on Monday, um, and Chinese workers don't do that. Um, so, I don't know, this is a little extra racism in there. But, um, so, the it starts to be a thing like all, all along the east coast there's factories where anytime workers go on strike uh the, the all the factory owner has to do is like hey i'll just get chinese workers in here like if you, you, you want less money like you'll just lose your jobs uh i'll hire some chinese workers um and then you know and, and then you're all out of luck so you better keep working at low wages uh, and this spreads, becomes a threat. And this is even you see in this picture, it has this Irish worker here, um, he's literally got a halo over his head. You know, and, and the name of their uh, union uh, at, at, in North Adams is called uh, the, the Order of the Knights of St. Crispin. So you know, they say the martyr of St. Crispin. And, you know, and he's, got, he's got this halo, and now you have the Chinese workers coming along. He's got his sword that says cheap labor on it chopsticks I, I don't know why it says that um you know uh i'm gonna chop off this guy's head and of course you know workers lose some of their collective bargaining power because of this uh threat uh you know of, of chinese labor so do they blame the factory owners who are uh paying them low wages and holding this threat over them no they blame the Chinese workers that are being used as the threat or being is, is a tool, uh, basically in this. Um, and you see, the, you know, as so, and of course, some Chinese workers are brought in on occasions, uh, you know, in, in larger numbers. And you start to see uh, this anti-Chinese xenophobia spread throughout the country. And uh, it's actually sort of ironic, but 10 years later that the North Adams Shoemaker Factory was so successful, they were able to buy machines and automate everything, and they barely needed any employees, so they fired all the Chinese workers. Um, and then those guys went into, uh, like they left the dormitories and formed a Boston Chinatown, which is still, I guess, kind of small. I, mean, I haven't been to the Boston Chinatown. I've only been to Boston for a few days once. Um, but yeah. Um, there were advocates for defending uh, Chinese people uh, against these attacks. Um, famously, Wong Chen Fu, who would later be called Chinese Martin Luther King. This is, um, you know, uh, decades before he was born and definitely before Martin Luther King ever became famous. So nobody called him that at the time, but he would end up getting that name later. And he was advocating for um, equal rights. He would pull these kind of stunts uh, you know, people were accusing like you know Chinese groceries of selling dogs and cats and things like that. So he would you know, say, I, I'll, "I'll pay five hundred bucks to anybody who, can, who gives me proof, uh, you know, who can show me a dog or cat that was sold at a uh, at a Chinese grocery." And of course, they couldn't. Um, 
so he, he's, he's advocating on behalf of the Chinese. Oh, I forgot to give a backstory on this. Um, so uh, Fu was built uh, really just at the beginning, you know, just before there was a lot of Chinese immigration coming to um, the United States. And, uh, but he, he was born in China and was adopted by some American Baptist missionaries who were there and, you know, in war torn China, um, where they were trying to help people and of course, uh, you know, convert people and whatnot. Uh, they adopted him, brought him back to the United States, uh, baptized him in the Christianity, gave him a Western education, went, he went to a Western university. And, uh, once he's, he's done, he went back to China for a little while, got chased out of there and came back and said, I'm going to defend Chinese people in America and was uh, sort of proof that everybody said Chinese people can't assimilate. Well, here's a guy that speaks, uh, uh, you know, perfect English, uh, you know, understands, you know, uh, you know, American culture, American religion, American references, all of these things. Like he's proof, they say he can't assimilate dude, this guy's assimilated. Um, and he eventually, like, he uh, uh, renounced Christianity and became a Buddhist. Again, you know, he, he kept his cultural Chinese identity while also being thoroughly American. Um, so he uh, defended Chinese Americans saying they can assimilate if you give them a chance. But he also advocated within the Chinese community. His, equal, his uh, Chinese Equal Rights League was... Um, you know, not just for defending the Chinese people, he also said like, hey, if you stay in your Chinatowns, nobody's ever gonna pay attention to you. If you don't vote or uh, participate in American civic life, the politicians will ignore you and you, the police will ignore you and whatever is done to you, uh, nobody will ever care uh, one way or another. You have to make yourself into a voice in American culture before anybody respects and pays attention to what you're saying. Um, he made some inroads of that, you, you know, in lots of ways he is unsuccessful in both in defending and trying to encourage Chinese people um, in lots of ways, but you know, he was at least, uh, you know, he started a kernel that would eventually be, begin to spread throughout uh, American Chinatowns. So, um, in 1877, uh, there was a, um, oops, far. today might be a little longer than I expected. No, I, never mind. Don't, don't pay attention to that. I think I'm about a half hour left. Um, so, uh, in 1877 was a particularly rough year for the American economy in general um, for a number of reasons I'm not going to go into, but it was a really, really bad depression throughout the 1870s. Um, uh, there were riots throughout the country. There's stories, especially on the East Coast and places like Pittsburgh uh, and Baltimore of like, like railroad employees, like having like literal battles with uh, with the U.S. Army, um, things of like you know lighting a train on fire and like and like like, like sending it into a station to like blow up the station, like shit was crazy in 1877. And you know the, 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 there's a whole number of reasons. You know, these people people didn't have jobs and th they were starving, uh, so people get desperate uh, in, in those moments. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, that th those riots are going to happen, but they're going to have a particularly anti-Chinese flavor um, because there are all, all these immigrants who are already distrusted, and there's a large Chinese population. They are going to be uh, the they're going to be you know the scapegoats. So they would have these huge rallies. Um, hold on one sec. Okay, my food, my dinner is ordered, so I have to probably finish in the next half hour. So um, they'd have these huge rallies uh, at, at sand lots and uh, get, you know, get, giving speeches. And apparently, some Chinese people had walked by um, and people attacked, attacked and beat these guys up. And then said, someone said, "On to Chinatown!" And this entire crowd of people, uh, you know, angry, upset, hungry people. Mis with misplaced anger, um, just tore apart Chinatown houses, shops, um, uh, any factories that, that that had Chinese people uh, were working in them, uh, and this ended up ends up going on for uh, days. I talk, and I talk about pogrom, um, not saying, but like uh, these anti-Jewish attacks. This is kind of a similar thing. Um, 
where you know you're going into this ethnic neighborhood and you know attacking these people mercilessly. Uh, they were famous had axe handles with them. You know, axe without the handles is still a big heavy piece of wood. Um, so uh, don't worry about the committee of public safety thing here. That's something in my California history class. Don't worry about that. Um, uh, one of the guys leading the, uh, these crowds, uh, you know, getting people worked up in, uh, over this whole summer. And uh, oh yeah, I said it went on for days, but no, I'm, they, it would flare up over the course of months throughout the summer of 1877. Uh, and one of the people leading this would be a guy named Dennis Kearney, um, who is a San Francisco labor organizer. Is kind of the phrase really? He's a demagogue. Um, uh, and, and I should say Kearney is not uh, Kearney Street in San Francisco, not named after this guy. This guy is an asshole. Stephen Kearney, that's the guy is named after is, I don't know, I don't know anything about him. He, 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 helped, he was a, a, a part of the US Navy who helped take California. So he maybe is an asshole, maybe not. This guy's definitely an asshole. Um, and he, uh, Kearney was an Irish immigrant that showed up at, like only a year before uh, 1877. And at first he was working against uh, the unions. He, he was a guy that was hired to kind of go club heads when someone would go on strike. Yeah, they'd go up and like beat up protesters and stuff like that. And then he realizes like, like I can, I can just be a regular thug here, or I can go on and like, if I have, these people will believe anything because they're desperate and they're hungry. So if I, uh, you know, if I tell them the things they want to hear, they're, they'll give me power and riches. So exactly what he did he, and he was a great public speaker uh and he would go out uh in front of um uh, these crowds and he'd start out really quietly uh and then get more and more excited get louder and louder and he'd like take off his hat and op to open his jacket and tear off his shirt and you know he'd just get like you know super passionate and people would get all into it and get all kinds of worked up and he kind of like he had these like sort of not quite communist or socialist ideas. I don't think he had thought through his ideas enough. You know, he was uh, at first really mainly attacking, you know, the bosses. This is the fault of the bosses who are, you know, aren't paying you and are, you know, aren't giving you jobs and things like that. Um, and then, you know, he'd gone on to blaming politicians. And his sort of his big thing is like, was uh, if a politician, uh, if you elect a politician who promises something and he doesn't actually do what you say, what he says he's going to do, you have the right to shoot or lynch him. Um, you would give these speeches where he, he literally says, shoot the first man who goes back on you after you have elected him intelligently. See that you hunt him down and shoot him. Um, another speech he said, before I starve in this country, I will cut a man's throat and take whatever he's got. The working man's party must win, even if he has to wade knee deep in blood and perish in battle. Um, so yeah, um, pretty heated stuff to be given to a crowd of angry, uh, uh, hungry people. Um, the Working Man's Party of California was, was his party that he'd started, you know, his political party completely centered around him. And like, it's all sort of, doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's not how democracy works. It's not how, uh, you know, uh, economics work. Like all of this stuff didn't really make sense, but it was like people were caught, were caught up in it anyway. Uh, he's a demagogue. A demagogue, if you don't know, it's a word that we either be using more often these days, um, but you know, should be explained every once in a while. Um, this is the definition I just took off of Wikipedia. I won't ask you this later, but it's a leader and a democracy who gains popularity by exploiting the prejudice and ignorance among the common people, whipping up their passions of the crowd and shutting down reason deliberation. Demagogues you have usually advocated immediate and violent action to address a national crisis while accusing moderate and thoughtful opponents of weakness and disloyalty. Demagogues often overturn or demagogues overturn established uh, customs and of political conduct or promise to threaten to do so. Most who are elected to high office change their democracy into some form of managed democracy, um, which means less democratic. You know, they end up consolidating power on themselves and you know, take away the voice of the people. Uh, so Kearney was a classic demagogue. Um, I wish I could think of a modern example of who would fit into this uh, category. Someone in American politics, politics today who might be considered a demagogue. I don't know, uh, my mind comes up blank. Uh, anyway, so every good demagogue needs a uh, scapegoat. Um, 
again, I, I, if we had one today, I don't know who, which immigrant group he would particularly target. Probably Latin American immigrants, I would think he would probably talk about. I don't know, whoever it is, but uh, Kearney uh, railed against uh, Chinese immigrants. He ended every speech saying the Chinamen must go. Uh, and he would talk about doing things like putting cannons up on top of Telegraph Hill, um, you know, what's where Coit Tower is in San Francisco, and shooting any um, uh, ships that, that had Chinese immigrants coming in and just sinking them in the, in the San Francisco Harbor before they can land to make sure like not a single you know, immigrant can get off the ship, um, you know, and dumb things like that. Um, and, you know, he was encouraging these people to, you know, attack, you know, riot against, you know, go into Chinatown and attack people. And he'll flame out. He's only really popular for not even a year in uh, San Francisco politics um, because he doesn't really have any ideas and people realize that. Uh, so he, he's kind of flames out and dies in obscurity. But his Working Man's Party of California has a little bit longer of a legacy. It's... Uh, that just happens to be the year that California decided we are going to write up a new state constitution. The state constitution was 30 years old. Uh, the state had changed a ton in that last 30 years. So they said, we need a new constitution. And right, and so we have to elect delegates. You know, in, in the 1877 election, we're going to elect delegates. To the, who's going to write up this new constitution? So right in the middle of it, all this anti-Chinese fervor, the Working Man's Party is super popular and currently super popular. That's when the elections are held. So the Working Man's Party ends up sending all of these delegates to Sacramento to write up this new state constitution. So they're going to write up a bunch of stuff into the constitution that is anti-Chinese. That was the reason they were elected. And things had died down a little bit in those years, um, but they're there. They are the most passionately anti-Chinese people. Um, so. Uh, they're going to put this stuff into the Constitution. And the Constitution on a whole is really, really actually progressive. Um, it has all kinds of, you know, establishes uh, public utilities, it regulates utilities, um, transportation and uh, communication are, you know, in the hands of government. It's too important for, uh, you know, for regular people to have stuff that, that, that no other state was doing stuff like that at the time. Uh, it restrained uh, corporations, uh, things like that. You know, in time of unfettered capitalism around most of the country, California was trying to rein it in a little bit. Um, but there's also going to be stuff in this constitution that says um, uh, it bars uh, Chinese people from working for uh, any sort of corporation. So that's a huge amount of stuff. Uh, it also, d d they're not allowed to work in any government, any state, local, county government they cannot work in. Um, it denies them from working in other industries like fishing. So those Chinese people can't be fishermen. Uh, all the fishermen in San Francisco didn't want to compete with the effect of Chinese fishermen. So they just write them out and said Chinese people can't fish. Of course, it denies them the right to vote. Um, it gives the authority to expel all Chinese people or segregate them uh, in cities. Um, it says the Chinese person can't bear witness against the white man in court. Um, you could literally, like, if you're... So say I was a Chinese guy and I saw my brother get killed um, uh, by a white man, I couldn't go to court and say, yes, I saw him do that. Uh, you know, that's what it has in there. Um, that's a weird analogy to be making right now. Um, anyway, um, so uh, most of this stuff will get overturned. This is an insane violation of the 14th Amendment and all of these rights that, are, that you, know, you can't discriminate against people based on a um, particular race, especially if they're born in this country. So most of it will end up having to get thrown out. Um, but um, they will find other ways to use those things later on. They're just going to have to be more subtle about how they discriminate, discriminate against the Chinese. Um, though it is enough, though, that uh, on the federal level, uh, they're, they're going to bar all Chinese immigrants from entering the country and make sure Chinese uh, immigrants can't become American citizens. Um, this is federal law, entire United States, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, you know, they've reached such a fever pitch of, you know, throughout the entire country, this fear of yellow peril uh, had spread to such a degree, uh, you know, people were, were just convinced that, you know, they have to go. Uh, they're, uh, I just saw something, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, 
you know, say, say, you know, no Chinese people coming to this country at all. So we saw the Page Act of 1875 was the first limiting of borders at all. The first time Americans had done any sort of limiting of borders. Um, but, you know, that was a, you know, this particular idea of bringing people into the country uh, under these certain conditions. This is the first law in American history that would exclude an entire group of people based entirely on race. Um, and surprising as that is, for all the racist things that had happened in American history, this is the first US law that actually says these, this race of people can't do something. They can't come into this country anymore. The ones that are here can stay. They're not getting kicked out necessarily. They're not, the ones here can stay, but they can't become citizens. So they, they'll never get the right to vote. They'll never be get, all, get all of those things. Uh, life is gonna be made very uncomfortable for those people because you know, they will always be left out of the system. Like I said, you can't vote in this country. Nobody will pay attention to you and like, as a group. So you will, you know, you, 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 people can treat you however they want to if, if, if you're not a voting bloc. Um, and I have a video here that I'm not actually gonna play. Um, you, can, you can click on it later. It's a Bill Moyers clip called Between Two Worlds, um, about six minutes. And it's a lot of stuff that I've kind of already said, uh, just for the sake of time. I got fried chicken arriving soon, so I, 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 wanna, I, I don't want to eat that cold. Um, so um, this is supposed to be a, a temporary uh, ban, the same way um, perhaps uh, a Muslim ban might have been sold. Say so this is just a temporary ban until we figure out what's going on. Um, but it was renewed um, and it made permanent in 1902. This will stay on the books until 1943. Um, we'll get into later about how I'll, all restrictions aren't totally lifted until 1965. But I want to be clear now, because this will be a thing later on, um, Chinese Exclusion Act ends in 1943. It does not end in 1965, it ends in 1943. I'll get to the 1965 thing later, uh, and the 1943 thing for that matter. Um, so anyway, uh, for at our first, it, it actually barred uh, any Chinese people from, uh, if they were born here, if, if, if you were, um, uh, you know, you have Chinese mother and father, you're born on American soil. According to the 14th Amendment, that says you're automatically an American citizen. Uh, at first, this act says, nope, you can't, you, like, if you're Chinese, you can't be an American citizen at all. Uh, but in 1902, in that version of it, after the Supreme Court said they had to do it, um, they were the law to say, okay, if you're born here, you have to be, you have to be a citizen. Um, but you know, for a long time, it barred any citizenship at all. So, um, confronted with legal challenges, uh, California is going to have to come up with some more unique ways to discriminate against Chinese people. And especially after the Chinese Exclusion Act, they're going to feel more emboldened to do that kind of stuff. Um, they feel like, you know, it sends a message that the entire country is with you to discriminate against these people. You just have to do it more subtly. You can't, um, you know, you can't just come out and say like, oh, Chinese people can't, you know, can't do this or that. You know, you have to you know, find other ways to, to do that. Um, and these are going to be familiar because we already talked about how the Jim Crow South did things. And you saw stuff like literacy tests. But there's nothing on there about black or white people. They just when they give the test, they know how to grade it, um, you know, things like that, or the grandfather clause and stuff like that. It doesn't say anything about there in black or white. It says, if your grandfather can vote in this country, then you are an exempt. Um, so they do little things like that. Um, and uh, they'll regulate um, laundry irons. Like the California has this heavy regulation against laundry irons. Well, why would that possibly be? Well, because Chinese laundries are a thing, uh, make life difficult for those people. Chinese fishing nets. Um, there's a certain kind of net that only Chinese people used. Say, we ban those no more. And it doesn't say anything about you know, Chinese people on there. It just says, can't use that kind of net. Um, fireworks used in uh, Chinese holiday celebrations. So, this is, so it bans fireworks. Uh, carrying poles even. There's a picture here you see of uh, this guy that has these, um, you know, just a pole with the baskets there. It's a way Chinese people carry shit around that no other country you know, here was doing at that time, but only Chinese people do it, so you can't have a carrying pole. What is a logical fucking reason that you would not be able to 
hang things on a pole and walk with it down the street? There is none. There is no good reason to ban that unless you are, it's discriminatory. So uh, that gives you an idea of the type of laws that existed in California. Sundown towns were another thing. Sometimes it's done officially, sometimes it's done unofficially. You know, if it was done in a certain way, uh, it was able to be under the radar of legality. But basically said, okay, Chinese people are allowed in this town. They're just not allowed to be in here after dark, which effectively bans them from living there. But, you know, it lets them come in to be able to do business. But, you know, say, well, we, we can't trust you after dark. And, you know, really it, bad things can happen to you if you are here uh, after dark. Um, most Northern California towns and cities, you know, a lot of them had this. Santa Rosa is one of them, um, for sure. A lot of those cities, um, you know, also said, you know, no black people after dark as well. I don't know if Santa Rosa had that in effect, but I know they banned Chinese people. So, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's, it's a form of legal discrimination. I mean, of questionable legality to be sure. So, um, in uh, segregation, also, you know, one of the hallmarks of the South, we just looked at a huge section of uh, segregation in this country and the battle against it. Uh, California absolutely had segregation, just like we had our own Jim Crow style laws. Um, we had laws that would ban uh, Chinese people from schools, hospitals, public facilities. Uh, theaters, you know, all of the same kind of, kind of thing. Uh, in Northern California, by and large, um, black, white, uh, uh, Latin American, um, in some cases Native American, that, that, that gets a little weird in that in California, but like those kids would be going together to school together, but uh, Chinese kids had to go to separate schools. And in that case, you know, in separate Chinese hospitals and, and, and things like that. Uh, Southern California, uh, had w w was had more segregation. Didn't have not have a large Chinese population, so that's segregation against uh, Mexican Americans. I'd already mentioned in a couple lectures ago about how that discrimination case um, ends up um, changing. You know, ends up saying California that has can ha not have any more segregation in public schools. Um, so, uh, yeah. Bottom line. Uh, Maybe I will put that video at this point. I have a few minutes left over. Um, you know, like I said, we do, if, if you were looking at the South um, in a bad way and saying like, oh, we, we, we would never do that in California. Um, yeah, think again, we, we, we did the exact same thing here, just against a different group of people. So uh, this is only a six minute long video and it's, it's, it's actually a preview for um, a, uh, a larger documentary, um, Bill Moyers on PBS, awesome documentaries always, um, but it gives you a, a, a different view and some nice visuals of the stuff that I was saying. So hold on one sec here. In 1887, a rancher out looking for his stray cattle on the Snake River between Idaho and Oregon came upon a gruesome scene. The remains of human beings washed up in a creek. They were so picked over by buzzards and coyotes that neither their features nor their race could be identified. Some of the bodies were found, one was found headless. Others were found with ax wounds. This horrible, horrible crime was committed there. And the savagery of the crime would indicate that it was more than just a robbery. Years later, the true story came out. A gang of white men, ranchers and schoolboys, had set upon 10 Chinese miners, shot and beat them to death, then dumped their mutilated bodies into the river. Four Chinese arrived at the camp the next day and were promptly murdered. The killers then traveled by boat downriver to another camp. By nightfall, 31 Chinese were dead. The leader of this group, Bruce Evans, 
was said to have told the others in the gang, let's do our country a favor and get rid of these Chinamen and let's do our favor for ourselves and get their gold. Local residents rallied around the suspects. Only three were tried and a jury freed them all. The Snake River Massacre was not an isolated incident. In 1882, the U.S. passed the Exclusion Act to stop Chinese laborers from entering the country and deprive those here of citizenship. That law ushered in the most violent decade in Chinese American history. The spread of anti-Chinese feeling was like a disease going through the white population. They became the scapegoats. They became sort of the solution. If we could just get rid of them, then our fortune would be better. The Chinese were foreign, did not belong here at all. This old idea was given new life by the law. In Tacoma, Washington, 600 Chinese were expelled and their houses burned to the ground. The Chinese of Juneau, Alaska, were loaded onto boats and set adrift. In Rock Springs, Wyoming, 28 were killed. The rest were driven out. Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, California. Chinese were lynched, Chinatown were burned, Chinese were run out. The last of the great fires was San Jose. When arsonists turned its Chinatown to rubble, a 17-year-old named Young Soon Kong packed up and fled. Like thousands of other Chinese across the West, he made his way to the one place that seemed safe, where the sights and sounds were reminders of home. Da Fao, big city, San Francisco's Chinatown. Hung the Chinese street, headquarters of Chinese America. The sidewalks were crowded with peddlers, cobblers, and fortune tellers, servicing the migrant laborers who converged here when their work was done. Fish cutters from the Alaska canneries, fruit pickers from the San Joaquin Valley, thronged the herbal stores and rice shops, temples, and gambling halls. Turn of the century San Francisco Chinatown for Chinese was the center of their, their world in, in America. You will hear the shouts of vendors selling their wares. There are also people speaking all different kinds of dialects. Toisan, Hakka, Canton City dialect. Six blocks long and two wide, Chinatown was a country within a country, filled with temptation for an ambitious young man hungry for life. Young had worked as a houseboy, got a taste there of American ways, and now the ways of Da Fao. My grandfather loved living in San Francisco Chinatown because he liked going out with his friends, there were restaurants, and his favorite, favorite activity was going to the opera. And there were three opera houses, three opera houses to choose from. But it was an insular world this young man was in, cut off by the exclusion law from American civic life. The law had barred Chinese laborers. The first time the U.S. excluded immigrants based on nationality or race. Those already here could stay, but could not become citizens. Essentially, Chinese will declare uh, permanent aliens. It meant that they could never participate in elections, that politicians would never have to pay any attention to them. And I think also it had a kind of symbolic significance in that it sort of read them permanently out of the American political community. The story of the exclusion years is of a people in between countries often unsure to which they belong. 
It's about families kept apart, lives shaped and misshaped by Chinese custom as well as U.S. law. To become American, the Chinese would have to wage a long campaign, not just in public, but inside their homes. Okay, I think that um, underscores a lot of what I had to say. Um, okay, well, obviously this is not you know fitting into the whole uh, three hour long class. This would have taken half of that class, uh, but circumstances are weird. I should not be that close. Uh, or, yeah, too old to be sitting that close and seeing all the stuff in my face. Um, I don't know, anyway, I will talk to you guys on Tuesday. We're gonna have, um, is my plan is to have a nice big lecture about sort of the peak uh, where we have closed borders almost completely. Um, and you know, what led to that as long as also um, uh, eugenics, uh, when we, you know, we, this all gets so racist uh, that we try to uh, regulate scientifically who can, who's able to breed. And well, I shouldn't say regulate, we actually, make sure it is in California, in this country and in California especially, um, we'll see them uh, sterilize a number of people who they deem to be unfit to breed. Uh, and I'll give you a hint, they don't do it to a lot of white people. Uh, so, all right, I'll talk to you guys on Tuesday. <laughs>